sisters, and if you'll come at this time, she's come to be baptized. If you're going to be praying for Susan, say amen. 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 Here she comes. All right. Upon my sister's profession of faith, I baptize this my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Give her a hand, folks. This, of course, will be our regular tithes and offerings for Sunday morning.
time we're going to have a baby dedication and I always enjoy these and of course uh, as a pastor you enjoy watching young life in your church Um, I don't know about you but I want our church to be filled with babies and children and uh, you know they're so important they are literally uh, the life of the church and uh, they're dear to the heart of God And I want us to be a youth-friendly church. I always want us to be a youth-friendly church. And uh, it's been, you know, a little while ago we we renovated our nursery. Remember that? And I had some ask, well, we don't have any babies. You know, why are we going to do all this? And I began to tell them, I said, well, faith says there will be babies in there. I see the nursery full. And the Lord, uh, in the last year and a half, has blessed us with a few of those babies being born, and uh, we're looking forward to a lot more to come. And uh, I'm thankful for that young life that, have come, that has come through our church recently. And at this time, I'm going to ask the Hill family and the Horton family, if they'll come and just stand uh, before the pulpit here, uh, one on this side, one on this side would be fine. And uh, we, we want to share in this. You say, this is actually a local church commission. I believe that God has commanded us as the church to dedicate. Matter of fact, my scripture that I'll be preaching from today uh, actually has uh, a lot to do with what we're doing here. And so the title of my message today is Jesus and the Children. Jesus and the Children. And we're going to talk about that important, uh, dedicating our children. We're going to talk about that issue uh, in the sermon this morning uh, and so, as we get started, if, if I may, could I have uh, all of my, everybody's attention? This is a very solemn ceremony, and uh, we want it to be special. And so, if you're going to be praying for these two families uh, as they raise their child, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Let's, let's, you've got the support of the church, uh, Horton family, Hill family. And I want to start this dedication off by sharing a few words. And uh, once I do that, 
uh, I will uh, challenge uh, both the father and the mother and uh, then we will have a prayer of dedication over these two special bundles of joy uh, today. So at this time, the Holy Scriptures record for us that Elkanah and his wife brought their child to Eli, saying, O oh, oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he shall, li- shall be lent to the Lord. That passage is from 1 Samuel chapter 1. Beloved friends, in presenting this child and these children for dedication to God, we recognize that you are moved by the impulse of parental love which prompts all sacrifices and promotes all efforts to bring comfort and blessing to the objects of its faithful care. You are anxious that this child may increase not only in strength and in knowledge, but also in the fear and favor of God. To this end, it is needful that you exercise watchful oversight upon every influence that may affect them and their youthful mind. And besides exhorting them to follow the path to heaven, to give them the more effective example of yourselves leading the way. Therefore, to all this church gathered here today, I charge you both, both of these families, I charge you most solemnly in the presence of Almighty God, that ye are to enter, uh, or excuse me, ye are to ever put around this child and these children every holy influence. Your fervent prayers and unfeigned love to the end that this, these children were dedicated today may early know God as Father, Jesus Christ as Savior, and the Holy Spirit as God. Now I'm going to ask both of you a question, and I want you to answer at the end. Do each of you, as parents of these children, Solemnly promise before God and these witnesses that you will, and to the best of your ability, endeavor to bring up these children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Will you be careful in your own conduct to live as Christian believers? And in the wholesome example to this child, will you abound in prayer for this child and these children and seek to restrain them from all evil habits and associates and to turn them and their mind to the Holy Scriptures and their feet to the house of God early seeking to lead them to Christ. At such time as you may feel, they understand the meaning of your efforts, making use of all helps that God has given you in the family religion and through the teaching and training agencies of your church. Do you promise these things? Now I want to charge Doug and Jay. I charge you as fathers to build and defend the home into which this little one has come. God grant it to be a home built firmly upon the ideas of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let nothing enter your home that will tend to destroy faith, confidence, and mutual love, without which no home can long endure. Let nothing enter your home that will injure the soul, injure the soul of the little child or crowd out the Master who said, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. My challenge to the mothers, Miss Stacy and Miss April, I charge you as mothers to always know purity of heart and purpose. If your child grows up to know God as his personal, as his personal experience, it will be largely because you have awakened their latent faith into their first consciousness, consciousness of God. And because you have nurtured them in the things of God, it is from you, the greatest object of their affection, that they get their first idea of God. As you bow with this little one at your knee, the sense of awe and reverence is awakened in their soul. From the purity of your eye comes the idea that God is holy, and from the gentleness of your voice, the idea that God is love. This time, I'd like to offer a prayer dedication. The Hills have come and they are dedicating their daughter, Hadley Blake Hill. And uh, we're going to give them a little small gift, a little New Testament. We're going to present this to her. Let's let's give her a hand. If you're going to be praying for her, say amen. Give this to mom, a little New Testament. 
and Jay and April have come to dedicate their son, Charles J. Lloyd Horton, Jr. And we give him a special New Testament, the Word of God. We'll give that to Jay. And at this time, I'd like to offer a dedication of prayer to both Hadley and CJ at this time. Let us pray. Would you pray with me, church? Father, we come before you today. And Lord, this is a promise that these parents have made. Lord, to raise their children, to raise little Hadley, to raise little CJ in the fear and admonition of the Lord. To lead them in the right paths of life. To follow you so that these children may follow them and in turn follow Christ. Well, we are thankful for the institution of the home and the family. We're thankful for it being important in your eyes. And Lord, it is, it is one of the greatest institutions on this earth. And Lord, we are thankful today that they have come and recognized their need for the help of your house and your church. And may these children forever be raised in your house. We're thankful for their faithfulness to come to you today. And Lord, I ask that you would place your hand upon Hadley today. I pray that you would bless her life. I pray, Father, that you would lead God and direct her. I pray, Father, that you would give, Lord, the parents, or Doug and Stacy, you would give them the wisdom to lead their children, Lord Hadley, Lord, in the right path. You would give them the strength and the endurance that they need to be the godly parents that you have called them to be. Lord, I pray for... CJ, and I I pray, Father, for his parents today. I pray that you would touch Lord Jay and April in a special way this morning, that you would also give them and grant them the wisdom to lead their home in the way that they should go, that they would raise CJ in the fear and admonition of you. Lord, I do ask blessings upon CJ's life today as well, that you would, as Hadley we've prayed for, lead God and direct his life. Lord, that you would... Uh, protect him and that you would bless him, Lord, and that he may follow his parents as they follow you. And so, Father, bless both of these parents today as they dedicate these children to you. I pray, Father, that they would forever remember this day that they stood here in front of this crowd of witnesses today. And Lord, I charge this congregation that have been, uh, Lord, uh, before their eyes, witnesses of what's taking place today, that we would encourage and help build both of these families to the best of our ability as friends, as Christian brother and sisters, Lord, to lead these in the right way. So Lord, today help us to be mindful that, Lord, it's the parents, it's the children and the congregation that is all involved in this dedication And Lord, we we give these children to you. And Lord, as these parents have surrendered them to your will and your way, I pray, Father, that you'd help them in the coming age. I know in our world today it seems, Lord, that it's tough to raise a family. But Lord, we know that with you all things are possible. And so, Father, we ask your blessings upon each home. In your precious and holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give these families a, a hand this morning. You guys may be seated. And she was happy about getting dedicated, as you can tell. (laughs) Amen. And I want us as a church to be mindful of our role also uh, as family members of the house of God, uh, as we are witnesses in that great ceremony. And uh, let's do be praying for CJ and Hadley and their families and Uh, Again, it's important. If you have a a child and you'd like to dedicate them, you can come see me. We'd love to do that for you with no problem. Uh, At this time, uh, if you uh, have uh, your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. I want to preach a message entitled, Jesus and the Children. Jesus and the Children. And... uh, It's a great passage of Scripture. You'll find the the account that we're reading today. You can find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does not record it, but uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke does. 
And uh, my, my, the book of Mark goes into more detail uh, in this instance where the children came to Jesus uh, than any of the other gospels. So that's where we're in Mark today. The book of Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. The Bible tells us, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. And he said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter there." In very, very, very stern warning Jesus gives us when he talks about the children. And then we see something we've never seen anybody get the privilege of doing in Scripture but the children. Look at verse uh, 16. And he took them up into his arms and put his hands upon them and blessed them. The children got to experience what no other person in Scripture had, and that is to be literally in the arms of Jesus. Isn't that something? What a privilege. Let us pray today as we look at Jesus and the children. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the challenge that we have here before us. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the ability to dedicate children to You, Lord. We're thankful for these parents that saw a need. And Lord, I I pray, Father, that you would continually bless us as a church that we would continually see more and more children being born, more and more servants that will come and follow you through the years. Lord, that you will use them to build your church, to build your house, to build your people. And Lord, we'll thank you for that. In your precious and holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. I want us to look at, first of all, the parents. I've never actually thought about the parents of these children. If you look at the Scripture, the Bible really doesn't use the word parents. But if you look at the word children, there's actually two or three different Greek words for the word children uh, in Scripture. And the, the word that is used here is more of a generic term for a young child. So we know that they are young and adolescent. We know that these children here uh, are in a home somewhere being raised by a mom and dad. We do know that for sure as we look at Scripture today. But in verse 13, the Bible says, they brought young children. Who is they? I think we would be safe and very safe to assume that they is actually the parents of the children. I've never thought about this. I don't know why I haven't, but for some reason, we always focus on the children. And and yes, that is the focal point of the passage of Scripture, but I think there's a truth here that sometimes is often neglected. We see the parents. They brought them to Jesus. We see the importance here. I think there's something here that we need to talk about and spend a little, a few seconds on, if you will, there in verse 13. These parents desired a great thing. Would you agree with that? These parents desired to bring their children to the Lord. They brought their children to Jesus. I can't think of a better person to lead your children to than Jesus Himself. I commend these parents who are starting on the right foot this morning by bringing their children and starting their children in the house of God. Allowing their children to be raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord. What a better time, what a better opportunity to dedicate your children uh, unto the Lord and dedicate, and really a dedication, let's be honest, a dedication is not necessarily so much for the children uh, as it is the parents. It is the parents coming before you and I and they are asking you to help pray for them as they lead their home and lead their children. While we do pray for the blessing of life upon CJ and upon Hadley today, we know we do also want to pray for the parents because the parents will be instrumental in leading their children to the Lord. Say amen if you agree with that. I'm in church today because I had parents who took me to Jesus. You say, you met Jesus personally? I haven't personally shook the hand of Jesus, but every Sunday morning, my mom and dad would load me up and we would go to Sunday school. 
We would go and I would learn in Sunday school, in primary Sunday school, in junior class, as I grew up into the uh, teenage class and then the young adults class, I would learn more and more about this man named Jesus, about Jesus who loved me and died for me. I began to study about Jesus. My teachers began to teach me about Jesus and what He'd done. And I began to see it in the lives of not just my mom and dad, but my deacons growing up, in the people that we would associate with at a Daniel Free Will Baptist Church. I saw Jesus in each and every last one of those believers and those men and women are still some of my heroes today and they're this morning sitting at Emmanuel Free Will Baptist Church. I thank God for allowing me to see Jesus in them. I was introduced to Jesus through Sunday school, through the preaching of God's Word, through junior church. I love junior church. I appreciate our junior church workers now and the past. We've got several folks here that have taught our kids. I appreciate our past Sunday school teachers, our future Sunday school teachers, our present Sunday school teachers who have introduced Jesus to every child they have come in contact with. And folks, let me put a plug in while I put a plug in here. Sunday school is so important. You know, we're living in a day where people would just say, well, let's just cancel Sunday school. Well, as long as I'm in the office that I'm sitting in in this church building, we will never ever do away with Sunday school. Sunday school is important, folks. It ought to be important in your schedule. You'll learn things in Sunday school that you probably won't learn much in detail in the Sunday morning service. But I saw Jesus in Sunday school. I saw Jesus in the sanctuary. All because my mom and dad loaded me up and brought me to church. Now, do you think it was easy for them every Sunday? It wasn't easy because they had to get us up. They had to wake us up. My brother was a hard sleeper and hard to get up. I could get up a little easier, but my problem was my wife cuts my hair now and she knows all about it. What do I have in the back of my hair? A cow lick, right? A cow lick. I remember every Sunday morning, it was either my mom or my dad fighting over what they're going to do with that cow lick. I remember my dad. My dad is not the most patient of people. My dad would get mad at my cow lick. I mean, they would spend minutes trying to get that thing just right. Why were they doing all that? They're trying to get me ready for church. They're trying to take me so that I can hear about Jesus in church. And it wasn't an easy feat every Sunday morning. Now, some mornings were easier than others. But there were times that it was hard. It was a fight. It was a hassle to get the kids from point A to point B to church. But may I tell you, it was worth every hassle. It was worth every mile. It was worth every uh, ups- being upset. It was worth every bit of it to take their children to see and know all about Jesus. I stand before you today because I had godly parents, not perfect parents, but godly parents who brought me to Jesus. And this is what these parents did. They brought their children to Jesus. They desired a great thing. They desired their children to be blessed. Now, I can't think of a mother or a father in this sanctuary that doesn't want their children to be blessed. We want our children to be blessed, don't we? We want them to have a prosperous life. Hopefully we want them to be blessed spiritually. I find a lot of times many parents are more worried about the physical side of things than they are the spiritual side of things. May I tell you, you can raise your child to be the most successful business person. They could have a million some dollars in the bank. You can have them driving the finest cars and the most fanciest things. But if you have not placed a desire in them to be blessed by the Lord or you don't have a desire for them to be blessed by the Lord, you have truly missed your mark as a parent. May I tell you, I would rather my child be poor and serving Jesus than to be rich and not know Jesus. You see, they placed a high importance on their children's relationship to Jesus. How do you know that? I began to study this passage. Note the word brought in verse 13. In the Greek, it literally means they continue to bring. And the picture that is being set, because if you look at the word rebuked, it it means to continue to rebuke. So what does that tell us about this, this day? What was happening was the disciples were fighting these parents. They were pushing these parents away. They were telling these parents to get lost. It really doesn't sound like something a disciple of Christ would say, does it? But they were pushing these, these, these uh, parents and these kids away. They're like, get away, get away, get away. 
No, are you crazy? He can't be bothered with your child. Move on. And the Bible says that even though these disciples continually tried to push them away, the parents continually kept trying to bring them. So what we have here is a struggle, right? Man, they didn't just walk up to the disciples and the disciples said, go and walk away. No, they kept coming. They kept trying to go to Jesus. So what do we see here? We see that they placed a high importance on their children's relationship with Jesus. They faced resistance from the disciples, but it did not stop them. Now, I've told you this before in the pulpit, but I'll tell it to you this way. If you desire to raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord as a parent, and you desire to raise them up to fear God and to love God and to serve God, may I tell you, there will be resistance in this world. You will have people that will fight you. You will have programs that will fight you. You'll have other people, other friends that will keep you from placing a high importance of your child's relationship with Jesus. It's so important to see what these parents did. They continually came to God. They weren't going to let these disciples stop them. They were determined. They had placed a high importance. May I tell you, There's a high importance today for our children to be in the house of God. Amen? Say amen if you believe that this morning. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. A high importance. I can just tell you this. If my mom and dad did not place a high importance to being faithful to God, I would not be here right now. I I learned faithfulness from my mom and dad. That's why mom and dad, your Your part in the raising of children is the most important part of all. And God has commissioned you. And I pray that our parents at Belvoir Fruit Baptist Church will be just like these parents. They're not going to stop when they hit a rock in the road. They're going to keep on aiming to make the importance of Jesus in their home and in their children's life a high priority. So we see these parents, they brought their children to Jesus. They desired their children to be blessed. And there's nothing wrong with that. And that's a great thing to be desired. And they placed a high importance upon their children's relationship to Jesus. But let's look at the disciples. Now the disciples are, I'm telling you, I have had a hard time looking over the disciples this past week. I just, I can't fathom. I can't fathom why, I mean, we're not just talking about Ordinary average Joe Christians, we're talking about the disciples. I mean, if there's anybody, if there was a list of people who are spiritually where it's at, you would think the disciples would be high up on that list. And, and my question is, why would they push away these children? They push the children and the parents away. Let's think about that for a minute. These men who were supposed to be spiritual giants pushed away people who were trying to come to Jesus. And and one thing can be drawn from that conclusion. They really didn't see the children as important. I think we'd have to come to that conclusion. Because if they were important, don't you think the disciples would have made a way? The disciples looked at the children and they didn't see them as something that Jesus would even want to concern Himself with. What a shame. Did they not know that Jesus had come to seeking to save all that was lost? Did they not know that Jesus was come to see sinners saved? And that includes the little children as well. Jesus loves them all. I want us to note, and and, and here's what I thought. I began to think about this and I said, so why didn't they care? I mean, why didn't they, they see that as important? But then I got to thinking, did the disciples truly realize what they were doing? Because had they, they would have definitely not been that way. I think that the disciples truly thought their intentions were good. They thought that what they were doing was the right thing. So I believe the disciples and their action were sincere. You've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. You can be sincere, but be sincerely wrong. You see, they were wrong. They kept Jesus away from the children. Basically, they got in the way. They got in the way between the children and Jesus. 
And folks, if you learn anything from this passage, here's what you learn. You don't want to be anywhere in between Jesus and the children. I don't want to be anywhere in the way between Jesus and the children. The disciples figured that out real quick. And see, another thing that I don't understand, if you look over in the next... in the previous chapter, Jesus had already talked about the importance of children. In in chapter 9 and verse 36, the Bible says, And he took a child and he set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of these such children in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth not, or excuse me, whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a milestone were hang about his neck and were cast into the sea. Folks, those are some pretty harsh words spoken by Jesus. Those are some pretty stern warnings from Jesus. Jesus says, hey, it's better for you to wrap a milestone, a huge stone around your neck and jump yourself into the sea than for you to get in between me and the children. Wow. I think children are close to the heart of God, don't you? I've met people who, you know, that they they feel like they they have to... I'm trying to think where I was going with that. (laughs) I've met people in churches, and, and I'm trying to be careful what I say. I've met people in churches that simply don't seem to care about what the youth are doing in the church. I've met people in churches who have a little child come to them and they'll talk about wanting to be saved. And I've heard people say in Free Will Baptist churches in my past, well, they don't really understand everything. May I say something to you? This is my policy as pastor when it comes to children. I will pray with that child as many times as he comes to me I don't care if I've prayed for salvation with him ten times. If he comes to me again, I will pray with him ten times. Because I want to make sure that those children know that they know that they know before they lay their head on the pillow at night that they are saved, that they are right with God. Now I understand we only get saved once. I understand that. But you know what? We're talking about children here. And when a child comes to you and wants to pray, you don't turn them away. I think if anything, this scripture teaches us that. I think if anything, this scripture teaches us, and, and I, you know, I, I've seen so many people take the place of the disciples where they would push the children away. Now, not literally push the children away, but by their words and their actions push the children away. And I think what God is trying to convey to us is the importance as a church to place a high importance upon the youth in the church. The youth are important and they are critical. I want you all to know, We've got young men and women sitting up here. I I don't call you kids. You're young men and young women. You're teens. God says to place a high emphasis upon you all. You're important to the cause of Christ. Now, everybody's important. But young people hold a special place in the heart of God. That junior church over there, I'm telling you, I wouldn't want to come in the way of what God's doing over there. Because that is special in the eyes of God. We are to take, now I'm going to be honest with you, as a pastor, I believe any, at all the churches I've served at, I believe Belleville Free Baptist Church has the youth in mind in all that they do. I believe that. I, I've never been to a church that sends its kids to camp and pays the bill like we do. Never been there. And you know what? I believe that's why God has blessed us over the years because we have looked after our young people. I think it's important. Jesus says it's important and it should be important to us. You see, he reprimands the disciples. The Bible says there that Jesus was much displeased. Look there in verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. The word displeased in the Greek means to be upset or annoyed. Folks, Jesus didn't just say, y'all need to stop that. The Bible says Jesus got mad. Jesus got upset and he says, what in the world are you doing, disciples? You don't need to do that. You bring those children over here. Jesus was upset. And the Bible says, and and we're looking at Jesus now. So we're turning our attention off the disciples into Jesus. He welcomes the children. Jesus loves all, but especially the children. They are close to His heart. 
This morning, Jesus desires for all the children to come unto him. Jesus begins to tell us there, and you can look there in verse 14. And he said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And so now we come to the children. This is my last point and we're done. The children. We, we know all about the children, don't we? We've looked at them in this passage of Scripture. We know that they're important in the heart of God. We know that Jesus desires for them to come unto Him. But then Jesus takes this opportunity to teach a spiritual truth that you and I need to get. And you say, well, preacher, today's been about baby dedication and I don't see how this applies to me. Folks, this next part applies to everyone under the sound of my voice in the entire world. Because Jesus now links the children to the standard of heaven. What does He say? Of such are the kingdom of heaven. He tells us these things. Think about this for a minute. What is Jesus trying to tell us? He's saying that these children, this is the type that heaven is made of. It is the standard of heaven. Heaven's condition is simply this. We must act like a child. If we desire to go to heaven, we must act like a child. Now, that sounds very contrary to what you've been told, I'm sure. I've heard many times, I've been told many times, act like an adult. Act like an adult. Quit acting so like a child and grow up. How many times we told people to grow up? Now, I'm saying that sometimes those things are needed and yes, you need... I'm, the passage here is not teaching us to be childish, but to be, like, to be childlike. It's not calling us to be childish, but to be childlike. And so, what is Jesus saying when He says, because this is very important because if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're going to miss this. You need to really get a hold of this before you leave today. Because Jesus says that in order for you and I to go to heaven, we must possess we must be like a child. Again, look at verse 15. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. That's very important because Jesus is saying that if we don't enter into heaven like a little child, then we will forfeit our opportunity to be in heaven and spend an eternity in a devil's hell. So what does that mean? I've been doing some research on children. Now, I don't have any children. So that makes it a little bit more tough. I thought, I said, man, I need to preach this in a few years because when I have children, I probably could do 20 times better than this. But I began to do some research about children. And of course, I, I, I've worked with children most of my ministry. I was a youth pastor. I spent a lot of time with children. And that time has taught me a few things about children. When Jesus says that we are to act like a child, what is He talking about? I think we would all agree that children are believing. Children are believing. They have a great faith and trust. You know, I thought about this. I never once doubted that my mom and dad was going to take care of me. I never wondered whether or not supper was going to be served on the dinner table that night. Why? I just knew it. Matter of fact, I'd walk in the door from school. Mom, what's for supper? I didn't say, are we going to have supper? I just said, what's for supper? Some of you moms are smiling at me because you know it happens to you. Your child doesn't doubt whether or not supper is going to be ready. Your child doesn't doubt whether or not they're going to have clothes on their back. Your child doesn't doubt whether they're going to have a roof over their head next week. They already know it. They have complete faith in you and your ability to be a parent. And God says we are to possess that believing spirit, childlike faith. You've heard that expression. God says if you want to go to heaven, you must possess childlike faith. You must believe Him. You must trust Him the same way a child trusts mom and dad. Children are receptive. They believe what they're told. Say amen if you agree with it. You know, uh, one of the things I've picked up over the years is gospel magic. And I'll do things. And they're like, wow, they believe that I literally made something disappear. And Brother Kent... Uh, and me, we do Friday morning ministry and uh, once in a while I'll go in there and I'll do a trick for them uh, at the high school. And, and you've got some of them that'll sit there and they'll go. 
But then I've, I've, I've noted something with them because most of them are like 17, 18 years old. They say, how did you do that? You want to know why? Because they know it's not possible for something to disappear in thin air like that. But a child, I go to junior church over there and pull out my magic tricks. They literally think I made something disappear. I mean, they really believe it. Because they're so receptive to anything. And Jesus tells us here that we're to enter the kingdom as a child. So we're to be believing, but we're also to be receptive of His Word. I want to ask you a question. Raise your hand in here if you've been saved before the age of 10. Everybody, raise your hands up high. Raise your hand if you were saved... If you've been saved in your teen years from 12 to 20, raise your hand if you were saved in those years. All right, now keep your hands up. I want everybody to keep your hands up. Those that raised their hand earlier, keep your, go ahead and raise your hands up. All right, you see that? Look around this morning. I'd say we've got at least 85% of the congregation that has been saved before they grew up. You may put your hands down. If you've been saved from the age of 20 to 30, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Saved 20, 30. We've got quite a few in here. Okay. If you've been saved from 40 to 50, raise your hand. Wow. Did you just see that? That big drop. We've got... How many hands we got? Raise your hand high if you've been saved 40 to 50. I see that. Wow. You can put your hands down. How about 60 to 70? Wow. White Miss Eva. Wow. Did y'all see that? Do you see what Jesus is saying here? You see, here's, here's the deal, folks. The older you become, the more difficult it is to receive Jesus. I think that's proven this morning right in this congregation. You receive Jesus early while you can. That's why it's so important to teach in our Sunday schools Jesus. That's why it's so important to teach in junior church. Then raise our kids up in the fear and admonition of the Lord because while they are young, they will learn of it. May I tell you this morning, if I did not have a mom and dad that would faithfully be the parents that God called them to be, I would not be here this morning. I learned upon them. They were receptive. But then children are innocent and pure. Think about this. Most children are untainted and unpure from the world. They've not been touched by the pollutions of this world. They're innocent and they're pure. But then look at this last thing and we're done. Children are dependent. Think about this. And we talked about this a little bit. They can't take care of themselves. We know that. They need help. They are dependent upon mom and dad. What does a child do when he or she has a hurt or has been hurt or have a problem? They take it to their father and their mother. What an example for us to follow in our relationship with our heavenly father. Yes, God wants us to be childlike. God wants us to depend upon Him. God wants us to be totally helpless in Him. His hands so that He can do for us what we cannot do ourselves. So the challenge is simply this. We enter God's kingdom by faith like little children, helpless and unable to save ourselves, totally dependent upon the mercy and grace of God. We enjoy God's kingdom by faith, believing that the Father loves us and will care for us in our daily needs. Some of us today need to start acting like a child. Run to the arms of Jesus this morning. Trust Jesus today and be saved. Depend upon Him. If we don't, we will not enter heaven. So today, do you know Christ as your Savior? You say, preacher, I don't know how to do this. I don't know all the details about Jesus and salvation. That's all right. a child doesn't either. But a child believes that Jesus can save them. Jesus says that's what you need to possess if you're going to enter heaven. If you died right now, would you spend eternity in hell or heaven? Which one? Would you receive Christ as your Savior today before it's everlasting too late? May I tell you this morning, God wants to save you wonderfully and gloriously today. He loved you so much that He bled and died on the cross. And all you have to do is receive it as a little child. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning.